Welcome back to Fundamentals of Chest Radiography. Today we are going to talk about pleural, interstitial and alveolar effusions. But before we dive into this topic, let me talk to you about an interesting mammal, the elephant. Elephants have an interesting way of crossing rivers. They cannot swim, so they need to walk in the riverbed. And while walking, they stick their trunks out because, of course, they need to breathe. Now, let's observe their anatomy and compare it to human anatomy. So, in humans, there's a parietal and a visceral pleura, as we mentioned before. And in between, there's a tiny amount of fluid, which allow allows the two layers of pleura to slide on top of each other. Now, when we are out of the water and we are breathing normally, the pressure within our lung equals the outside pressure. And since we are not in water, there's no water pressure that's pressing against our bodies. On the other hand, if an elephant dives into the water and walks through the river, their bodies will be submerged into water of about two or three meters. Now, you can imagine that to counteract those forces, the body will raise the arterial and the venous pressure by the same amount. And since elephants stick their trunks out while walking in the water, the pressure within their alveolar space will equal the normal outside pressure, which is about zero. So there's a huge gradient in between the two, which, if elephants didn't have a special anatomy, would cause them to drown in their own fluids. But elephants have a very special anatomy in that their two layers of pleura are much, much thicker than ours, and that they don't have a, a true pleural space because it's obliterated by connective tissue. So that prevents the transudation to occur and doesn't allow the elephant to drown in its own fluid while walking in deep water. Now the reason I'm telling you this is because this kind of relates to human anatomy in a sense that back in the days when uh, TB, we had the TB pandemic for example in Europe and uh, a lot of patients had recurring pl recurrent pleural effusion, one way to treat the recurrent pleural effusion was to perform what's called pleurodesis when they put talc in the pleural cavity which caused um, the two layers of the pleura to stick together and uh, effusion would stop. If you would like to read more on this topic I would uh, suggest you to read this uh, PDF that I included in this slide. But for now let's go on and talk about fluid within the human body, in, in the human chest uh, cavity. So, fluid in our bodies can occupy three distinct spaces. First, it can be in the pleural cavity, it can be in the interstitium of the lung, or it can be within the alveolar space. So, if, again, fluid reads the textbook, since it's a heavy material, and the patient is erect, the fluid will accumulate in the subpulmonary region, so below the lung. As the amount of fluid increases, the diaphragm will be inverted, fluid will appear in the costophrenic angle, and you will gradually see the meniscus sign, which I will talk to you about in a second, and then fluid will work its way up along the lateral chest wall, it'll get into the fissure, so that's, that's how flu fluid uh, accumulation is seen in the human body. Now, it's impossible to tell whether you're seeing blood, pus, or just a normal transudate on a chest x-ray. For that, you need to perform a pleural tap, or you need to obtain a CT, but, that, but this is not the topic of this talk. As I mentioned, when fluid appears in the pleural cavity, it initially collects under, under the lung, between the lung and the diaphragm, and 
since this is very difficult to pick up, we normally do not even suspect it unless we see it blunting the costophrenic angle or appearing in the horizontal fissure. And in this case, if you obtain a chest x-ray in exploration, you will see that the normal peaking of the diaphragm will be more lateral on the exploratory image due to the fact that the fluid is pushing it out towards the lateral side. And on the left hand side, it's a little bit more easy to pick up because normally there is a distance between the gastric air bubble and the left hemi diaphragm. Now, if there is, a, if there is some fluid accumulating below the lung and in between the diaphragm, then that distance will increase accordingly and uh, that you can see if you have seen enough normal chest x-rays. We normally see the meniscus sign either on the right or the left if we have more fluid than uh, just enough to fill the subpulmonary region. And uh, let me try and explain the meniscus sign to you. And uh, the meniscus sign can be understood by the so-called plaster model. So imagine that you fill the pleural cavity with plaster or with cement. And then this is what you would get because normally the pleural cavity surrounds the lung like this. This would be the left lung and the, and the, and the, and the left pleural cavity. So you can imagine that on the chest x-ray, this uh, plaster or the fluid that the plaster is representing would reach this high. So this would be the apex of the meniscus and the apex of the fluid within the pleural cavity. However, you see this as a meniscus line because relatively there is much more fluid out here in the lateral side than in the medial side and this you can understand by looking at the plaster model from the top and if you imagine two x-ray photons one is going through section a and then traversing the the, the lung and then going through uh, a star uh, section then this photon will not lose a lot of its energy thus the area represented by that photon will remain transparent. On the other hand, if you imagine a photon that goes through section D or even section E, it'll basically just go through fluid and uh, of course some soft tissue and some bones in front and uh, after, after. So it'll lose a lot of its energy and thus the area represented by that photon will be white. If you suspect pleural effusion and you only have x-ray at your disposal, you can um, get what's called the decubitus film. So you can lay the patient on his side, either the left hand side or the right hand side. And uh, then the fluid will layer out and you can easily pick it up. Another reason why you would do that is if the patient has a lot of fluid and you suspect an underlying pathology like cancer, then uh, let's suppose that this patient has a central tumor. Well, if you clear the fluid away, then the hyalur region will become visible. And if there is a cancer within the, within the central structures, then you will see that. Of course, if you're not sure, then you can obtain uh, an ultrasound scan or a CT scan as well. Sometimes fluids get trapped in a fissure and this we call a pseudo tumor or vanishing tumor is the other word because this is uh, this is of course not a solid tumor there is just fluid that get trapped in the horizontal fissure in this case and if you give the patient medication diuretics then uh, this tumor will vanish quite quickly. Now we're back with the supine film, which uh, 
I mentioned before that as a radiologist I do not like because a lot of disease goes uh, undetected on the supine film unless unless the abnormality is striking like in this case so this patient has a lot of uh, fluid in the right pleural cavity and you can you can tell that by noting that the contour of the right hemidiaphragm is lost and that there is diffuse haziness or opacity it's quite homogeneous opacity uh, over the right lung and uh, that has to do with the fact that the fluid within the pleural space takes up the amount of uh, available space and so you will see the added haziness over the whole lung and of course sometimes you will see the fluid within the fissures as well now in the supine patient when there isn't too much fluid within the pleural cavity it might be a little bit difficult to pick up the presence of pleural effusions because you won't see the diffuse almost homogeneous uh, opacity so imagine that your patient has uh, some pleural effusion but not much like you can see that on this ct this this is an image taken just below the carina and you can see that this image is taken in the apical region and uh, and uh, on the topogram of the ct which is very similar to a chest x-ray you can see that the lung is not opacified due to this much fluid and the fluid is is barely visible at all it's only visible up in the apical region and again it has to do with the fact that relatively there is much more fluid in the apical region versus the basal areas because down here there is a lot of there's a lot of lung which causes transparency or darkness on the image versus here where you have just a tiny amount of lung tissue aerated lung tissue and there is a lot of fluid and so the easiest place to pick up a tiny amount of pleural effusion on the supine image is either the apical area or along the lateral chest wall this image you have seen before last week to be more specific this is a case of a hydropneumothorax where, where there is a lot of air and a lot of fluid within the pleural cavity and you see this nice horizontal layer in between the two and of course the atelectatic right lung as well if there is pleural effusion then you can always perform an ultrasound if you position the convex transducer at this location then you will get an image like this one where you will see the liver the echogenic line of the diaphragm and uh, the anechoic fluid below the lung so this would be the lung and this is the subpulmonary region behind the lung because it's close to the vertebral bodies and in front of the lung because this would be the anterior part of the patient and uh, you can with ultrasound you can differentiate a homogeneously black uh, fluid versus um, a more echogenic fluid which might be pus or blood etc and of course you can guide needle placement as well let's talk about pulmonary edema because um, this is this is a this is a common problem in medicine where you have to differentiate between cardiac causes of pulmonary edema versus non-cardiac causes and the way to do that is to insert a Schwann-Gans catheter into the patient we would do that from uh, from a vein in in this case we inserted the catheter in the subclavian vein on the right and then the catheter goes through the superior vena cava right atrium right ventricle 
ends up in the pulmonary artery, the main pulmonary artery, and then the right pulmonary artery. And if you stick it out a little bit farther away, then uh, it'll the balloon will end up in a in a capillary. Um, you can you can uh, read and hear more about these electrodes in my very last talk, which comes at the end of the semester. So this is all I wanted to say about the Schwangens Cathedral at the moment. And uh, I, I also want to mention, because that's important, that the pressure which you measure over here nicely correlates with the pressure within the left atrium. And that allows you to make the distinction between a cardiac and a non-cardiac pulmonary edema. So in the lung, under normal circumstances, the pressure is between 6 to 12 millimeters Hg. And then the chest x-ray is normal. But as the pressure in the left atrium and thus in the lung rise, then you will see different si signs on the chest x-ray. First of all, normally the upper lobe veins are, are not that open. They do not store that much blood because much of the blood in the lung is located in the basal segments. However, if uh, the pressure is high, then the blood cannot, cannot easily exit the lung and go into the heart so that fluid needs to be stored somewhere and so the excess amount of fluid will need to be stored in the veins of the upper lobes which now will open and this we called cephalization of the pulmonary vasculature. It's uh, not that easy to pick up but if your eyes are accustomed to the normal chest x-ray you will you will tell the difference. If the pressure goes even higher, above 19 millimeters of Hg, then you will see, for example, peribronchial cuffing, which is not thickening of the bronchial wall itself, it's thickening of the interstitium surrounding the bronchi. And uh, within the interstitium of the lung, there are, of course, lymphatics and veins and, and smaller arteries, etc. So these will be the structures storing the excess amount of fluid. This will cause thickening of the interstitium and thus you will see the apparent thickening of the, of the wall of the bronchi. You will see perihilar haze and the famous curly lines. Curly A lines are thicker and they go from the center to the periphery but they never reach the periphery. Curly B lines are one to two centimeters long, they are perpendicular to the pleura and they are quite thin. And of course you will see the meniscus sign of pleural effusion. And when the pressure goes even higher, above 25 millimeters Hg, then the alveoli will get filled with fluid and you will see the batwing edema, which is a fluffy bilateral central type of uh, haziness or opacity which spares the periphery and uh, this is very bad news for the patient when you see this chest x-ray. Word of caution, so by definition an infiltrate or an airspace opacity is something that occupies the alveolar space that is normally taken up by air. Now this something can be due to pneumonia, drowning, cancerous cells, blood or even transudate. The, the problem with this is that they all look similar on the chest x-ray because the only thing you see is added opacity. So in practice it's very very important for us to acquire as much information of the patient as possible so as to be able to give a nice report back to the clinician. I hope you learned a lot during this talk as well, and I will see you next time.